Well, officially, welcome everybody this afternoon to Unit 3. Uh, my name is Emily Voss. I am the Lead the People State Coordinator for Virginia. I'm joining you today from James Madison's Montpelier. So some good Madison vibes for you guys today. Uh, in just a minute, I will have the judges introduce themselves, and then they'll ask you to introduce yourselves and your coach. And from there, y'all know the drill. Uh, they will read out your question, and then we'll proceed with your four-minute response, some Q&A questions, and then some follow-up time. Um, so with that, I am going to pass the baton uh, to the judge panel for Unit 3. Well, thank you, Emily, and uh, welcome, everyone. Congratulations for uh, getting to this point, and uh, we look forward to uh, hearing from you. Relax. We're going to have fun. Uh, learning from you uh, about the Constitution. Uh, my name is Joe Stewart. I teach in the political science department at Clemson University in South Carolina, been involved with the Lead the People program for a, a long time and always look forward to these conversations. Mike? Mike, you're muted. I'm Mike Miles from Birmingham. Uh, anytime anybody hears my accent, nobody ever asks me if that's Birmingham, Michigan or Birmingham, Alabama. They seem to be able to figure that out somehow. I don't know how that is, uh, but I, I'll, try to, I'll try to speak Birmingham, Michigan for the next little while. Uh, I told the wildcard team, the one that y'all beat so badly to get to be the state champion, I told them a little while ago, I was scared that I was going to have to see y'all today after your basketball team had beaten mine. But my basketball team lost to UCLA in overtime, and then y'all beat UCLA, which we really appreciated very much. Thank y'all for doing that. Made us feel a lot better. So I'm in a great mood with the whole state of Michigan this afternoon. Thanks for coming to this, and we'll look forward to this. I'm Donald Rogers. I'm, um, I taught history at Central Connecticut State University. Uh, before I retired, and I've been involved with the, with the people for a very long time. It's a great program, and I always enjoy these conversations with you. And so, again, relax, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Please introduce yourselves and your teacher. Hi, thank you so much for allowing us to testify before you today. We are a unit from East Grand Rapids High School in Michigan, coached by the lovely Adam Horos and Ben Langholtz. We are composed of three juniors and one sophomore. My name is Olivia. My name is Ava. I'm Rachel. I'm Ainsley and we are unit three. Great, well, good to, good to see you here. Uh, we are going to look at question one uh, today and uh, I'll read that question so they'll have it in the recording and, and when it, uh, when it goes viral, people will know what we're talking about. Uh, it starts with a quote from, a quote from Justice uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes. I do not think the United States would come to an end if we lost our power to declare an act of Congress void. I do think the union would be imperiled if we could not make that declaration as to the laws of the several states. What impact has judicial review had on federalism? Is judicial review a counter-majoritarian practice? Please support your position. What limits, if any, would you place on the practice of judicial review? You may begin. Judicial review has been an indispensable component of the American system of federalism since its establishment by Justice Marshall in Marbury v. Madison. However, in our nation's early history, the court did not take a defined stance on the balance of federalism. Some cases, such as Dred Scott v. Sanford, limited the influence of the federal government, while McCulloch v. Maryland and Gibbons v. Ogden strengthened federal power over the states. After the Civil War, though, the court's influence on federalism has noticeably increased. In the pre-New Deal Lochner era of our nation, judicial review more often limited the federal government and let states retain some of their autonomy. For example, in U.S. v. E.C. Knight Company, the court ruled that the Commerce Clause of Article 1, Section 8 could not be used to regulate manufacturing or restrict commerce within a state. Furthermore, in the case Hammer v. Dagenhart, the court ruled that federal laws regulating child labor were unconstitutional because production is not included within the scope of the Commerce Clause. Following the revolutionary changes of the New Deal, judicial review generally shifted back to overturning state laws in favor of federal regulations. 
This may have been partly because of Roosevelt's threats to pack the court if they continued to overturn New Deal legislation. Both NLRB v. Jones and Wicker v. Filburn upheld Congress's power to regulate essentially anything related to commerce under the Commerce Clause. Later, in Gonzales v. Reich, the court ruled that the Commerce Clause also allowed regulation of marijuana usage within a state because of its impact on the national market. A primary role of the Supreme Court is to overview state and federal laws which have already been passed by the majority of citizens. So the court striking down laws is counter-majoritarian by definition. Court decisions can also be unpopular amongst the United States citizens. For example, Texas v. Johnson only had a 20% national approval rating after the decision, and Bobadine v. Bush only had a 34% approval rate. By ruling against the actions of popularly elected officials and acting in opposition to the nation's opinion, the court is counter-majoritarian. However, Madison was correct that the Constitution is fundamental law, and when the will of the legislature stands in opposition to that of the people, the latter must prevail. The decision in Texas v. Johnson upholds the American people's value of freedom of expression, even if disrespectful towards the government. The decision in Bomadian v. Bush upheld the American value of due process, found in Article 1, Section 9, as well as the 5th and 14th Amendments, even though Americans wanted to deny this right to suspected terrorists. In this way, judicial re review upholds the values of Americans as a whole, not just the current preferences of the majority. Therefore, while the court may be counter-majoritarian in the moment, its job is to always uphold the higher law of our supermajority. There are many limits on judicial review in place today, so further limits are unnecessary. For example, the political question doctrine established in Baker v. Carr explains that the Supreme Court's purpose is to only decide on issues relating to the Constitution and federal law. Therefore, the court must not decide on political questions, which they further demonstrated in Gilby Whitford. Additionally, the court practices stare decisis and reinstates the precedent set by previous decisions unless they are overturned by new ones or new circumstances arise. This was displayed in Planned Parenthood v. Casey as the Supreme Court built their decision off a standard already established in Roe v. Wade. Another restraint on the judicial branch is that they hold neither the purse nor the sword, meaning controversial decisions must be supported by other branches. This is best seen in Brown v. Board of Education, which had little effect until the executive branch and finally state governments enforced school integration. This lack of power also forces the court to wait until the right time to hear impactful cases. This was displayed prior to Obergefell v. Hodges as the court denied a writ of certiorari several times to similar cases. Likewise, while the court has ruled on election laws in the past, it wisely deferred to states in almost all 2020 election lawsuits. Finally, when necessary, the legislative branch can also overturn decisions, as seen in the 19th Amendment's power to demolish the Minor v. Happersett decision. Thank you. We are now ready for your questions. Well, thank you. Um, you you've raised some interesting uh, ideas here. You talk about the, the court being counter-majoritarian by definition, and you've given some examples of uh, both legislation that's been passed and public opinion. When we say counter-majoritarian, are we talking about what legislatures do or what the people, public opinion believes? Because sometimes those are different. Can you help me kind of tease that out? Well, the legislation is only voted on and put in office by the majority. By the majority, With our current electoral system, not only is the executive branch, but also both houses of Congress are um, elected by a first past the post system. So they are elected by the majority. And then for a law to pass Congress and to get through um, the legislation, it must be a majority vote in the House, in the Senate um, to be passed. So in this sense, these laws are being put forth by the majority because the legislation is has to vote in a majority vote and they were elected by the majority of the people. Are there some equal protection issues in this? Uh, if y'all mentioned that there are mounts in the election laws, election challenges, this, at least in 2020, back to the states. And my state just passed a bill well, for one thing, shortening the runoff periods from six weeks to three, which will make it harder to get a ballot, fill it out and mail it in and it be received in time. So they're trying to do away with mail-in ballots in that way. If a voter in Illinois can, you know, or let's just say Michigan, let's do Michigan. If a voter in Michigan can vote on the same day or have plenty of time to mail in their ballot, but Georgia and Alabama pass laws keeping their citizens from being able to do that. 
isn't the Supreme Court violating the Equal Protection Clause when they let states decide who can vote this way and who can't? Yeah, I think they are violating the Equal Protections Clause, but however, the reason that they declined to hear these cases and return them to the states is because of the, um, it's so it's such a controversial issue right now, the election lawsuits of this fall. And so the court decided to return those to the states because they didn't want to have to deal with such a controversial and political topic, but they could still decide to hear cases of this nature at a later time, just not at, at the moment. It was not the, it was not the time to hear those cases this fall. Also, the reason why these voting restrictions are occurring is because of the case Shelby County v. Holder, which was decided in 2013, and this nullified the preclearance section of the Voting Rights Act, and this is why states no longer have to um, nullify their voting laws against the federal government. You know, Article 1, Section 6 of the Constitution leaves election proceedings and how that works up to the state legislatures. And so it's not necessarily um, like going against the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment because it's upholding Article 1, Section 6 of the Constitution, which gives the states autonomy to decide how their own elections um, will proceed. And as my colleague Ainsley mentioned in 2013, when the Supreme Court decided on Shelby County to nullify Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, this is not necessarily getting rid of um, equal protections. It's really just upholding that the states are constitutionally entitled to run their own elections. And to correct my colleague, I believe it's actually Article 1, Section 4 of the Constitution, which gives states the power to um, uh, make election laws. And I agree with my colleagues. I think that um, it's very important that the states retain some autonomy in their election processes. But I also think that it's very important that the federal government, specifically the Supreme Court, sets um, baselines to um, ensure that people's rights aren't infringed on. Joe, if I can follow up on that just one second. Let me ask you a quick one. Would it be better if the court allowed the states, the individual states, to set their own election laws for state and local elections, but the court standardized, that may be not the best word, any voting rights in federal elections so that every vote for president, every anything, would be equally protected no matter where you live? Would that be better or is that really violating the state's rights? guarantee? Personally, I think there's definitely a fine line between how much um, federal involvement in elections is too much. But over the past 250 years since the establishment of our nation, there have been more federal restrictions put in place. I mean, the Voting Rights Amendment, the 20 or the Voting Rights Act, the 24th Amendment and other um, things during the civil rights era specifically limited the state's power to suppress one's vote. And I think this is a really good example of how the federal government needs to step in in certain times. And that's not really denying anyone their constitutional right to run an election as long as that election is fair. Thank you very much, Dr. You argued, yeah, um, you argued that the uh, Supreme Court uh, intervened more against state legislation um, not in the early years, but later on. And I'm wondering why that was the case. Uh, did the states become more a threat to the survival of the federal union as time went along? We mentioned the Civil War in our essay as a turning point because this truly was a shift in many of the democratic ideals of the United States. The Civil War, of course, as everyone knows, is a major issue of contention because we did have states leave the union or attempt to. And this really demonstrates how during this time there was a major shift in federal versus state powers because so many states were arguing that there are certain powers to disagree with a certain act of Congress or disagree with a Supreme Court decision is supposed to be superior to their um, binding agreement to join the Constitution. And so I do think since the Civil War, the states have, and leading up to the Civil War, the states really have been posing an increasing threat as they've gained population, power, and popularity even throughout the world. Why is the Civil War such a watershed then? What, what happened uh, at, at or after the Civil War that made the big difference here? But, 
I believe that before the Civil War, uh, we just didn't have a lot of uh, Supreme Court cases um, that occurred and afterwards a lot more did happen. And this is this entered the Lochner era of Supreme Court cases. And we saw a lot of the federal government coming in in cases such as Lochner uh, v. New York and striking down economic regulations. And uh, yeah. So what is the Lochner era all about? Yeah. After the case, U.S. v. Lo um, after like the during the Lochner era, there was a lot, um, a lot of Supreme Court cases that really went against regulating the states and allowing them to kind of have their own autonomy over um, certain decisions while still maintaining the Constitution. And this greatly differs when the end, the Lochner era ended and shifting into more of the Warren courts, which were much more, much more activist courts. This is when we saw a great increase of Supreme Court power to nullify different state legislations and federal legislations to uphold federal power. What, um, what does the Supreme Court limit itself by adhering to precedent Oh, good. We'll, we'll, never, we'll, never, know we'll never know the answer. We'll never, never know. Find I'm going to buy that card from Emily one day. Right. Yeah, I, I, was, I was hoping to get the answer to that because that's where I was going with one of the questions, too. Uh, very much enjoyed your presentation, a good, good broad sweep of, of things, and you made it clear that you thought uh, judicial review was, was indispensable. You, you have a well, I thought, the question about what do we mean by majority when we're talking about uh, counter-majoritarian? And, and you make, uh, I think, the very logical argument that we're, you know, that, that in fact legislation uh, must be produced by the majority. Now, that presumes that we've got uh, kind of fair representation. And so we could go down that road if we if we had more uh, more time to do it. But I like you mentioning things like the first past the post electoral system, which makes a big difference uh, in, in our country. Um, the, I wish we'd had more time to, to go where I think Judge Miles' question was going. You had mentioned the political question doctrine and stare decisis. Um, when do we know when those should be used and ignored? Well, we know when the court tells us uh, that it should. So sometimes they tell us, oh, we can't look at this because that's a political question. And yet by the same criteria at another point, they'll go ahead and make the decision or same with stare decisis. The one thing I would have suggested that you you do to kind of fill in the blanks is it's the, the Civil War, the important point about the Civil War that is relevant to this question is that we follow this with the 14th Amendment. Uh, and the 14th Amendment has uh, uh, the citizenship clause, equal protection, due process, and privileges and immunities. And in particular, the due process clause turns out to be important because when the court does get around to uh, applying the Bill of Rights to the states, it's that due process clause of the 14th Amendment that they use. And that would have really strengthened the argument that, that you were making here. But I enjoyed our discussion today. Uh, good job. Thank you. That was, pretty, that was pretty good, what he just said right there. Um, I think your participation was so much fun. Uh, each one of you would take a really hard question and really dig down and answer it rather than skipping around. And it made it so much easier for us to realize that the entire unit had um, had something going. John Wooden was the basketball coach at UCLA in the 60s and 70s. And before the season would start, he would write down how many games he thought his team would win that day, that year. And he would seal it in an envelope and put it in his desk drawer and not open it till the end of the season and see how close he was. I have a thing like that. When I'm getting to judge this, I write down ahead of time how many mentions of Alabama violations of law 
will be mentioned that day. Emily, if you're keeping count, this is our eighth unit, and there have been five units that have mentioned it so far. I don't remember, Joe, what number I wrote down, but we're making good progress toward it, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. You can't really be a hearing unless you point out some constitutional violation emanating from Alabama. Emanating so. from Alabama. We're, we're so proud of that down here, I guess. I agreed with so much of what you said. The last thing I'd say is there's really only one thing that you said that that I have some real problems with. Your teacher is a very good teacher and highly skilled, but lovely. I don't know if I would really go to that level. I'd just let you all decide whether that's the right word for it. But he did a lovely job today and a lovely job getting you ready. Thank you. Dr. Rogers. No, I, I very much enjoyed your presentation. Uh, you made some really cogent points about judicial review. I really, really like your strategy of making a point and then back it up with evidence and examples of court cases. I thought that was very, very uh, effective. Um, I echo Professor uh, Stewart's uh, point about uh, the significance of the Civil War. Yes, I mean, uh, the, the judicial action, you know, uh, uh, increased against state, uh, state action uh, after the Civil War because of the results of the Civil War and the constitutional law, the 14th Amendment. You know, they created a new constitution, sometimes people say. So that would have clinched your point. You know, that, 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 that's why the large reason why uh, the number of cases uh, um, uh, picked up. So um, um, I really like your, your point about the Lochner era, but I think it's a point in progress uh, because you might have been able to define a little bit more uh, crisply and designate its chronological bookends. I mean, it's, it's often thought Lochner era lasts until the New Deal. And uh, the case of West Coast Hotel versus Parish and others sort of brought that to an end. You know, um, and so, the, uh, so this is an era you, you suggested rightly and could have amplified on it. You know, when the Supreme Court is being very aggressive and striking down protective economic legislation on the state level. Um, and that, that again came to an end in the 1930s. So um, it's a really strong point and, but I think a little, just a little more factual grounding could have helped you make that a uh, little uh, more effectively. So very good conversation. I wish we could go on. <laughs>